Our scripture reading today is John 8, 31 to 36. Jesus spoke to the Jews who had believed him. If you obey my teaching, he said, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's children. We have never been slaves of anyone. So how can you say that we will be set free? Jesus replied, what I am about to tell you is true. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. A slave has no lasting place in a family, but a son belongs to the family forever. So if the son of man sets you free, you will really be free. that Lucas was having the scripture reading this morning. Thank you, Lucas. And thank you, John, for the message that you have to bring to us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, John. Better. Good morning. Let's bow our heads in prayer as we invite the Lord to join us as we learn about his free gift. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this beautiful day, this summer, this time to be together. And I ask that your Holy Spirit be here with us. Pour out on us. Open our hearts and our minds. And will you write your law on our hearts and our minds and change our stony hearts for a heart of flesh? I ask, Lord, that, you will, uh, that your words will be spoken today and that we will draw closer to you. And thanks for drawing close to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I have to say, I really enjoyed that children's story. Didn't you enjoy that? I love it Mike gives a children's story. And this time he told me I was cool. That's, I like that. So I appreciate that. Awesome. Wonderful talking about Jesus being our living water um, and the free gift. Goes into what we're talking about so well today. Let's open up in our books to John chapter 8, verse 31. It's our scripture reading for today. John chapter 8, verse 31 and 32. And it's talking about truth. So Jesus is talking to some Jews that are there. Um, and he wants to talk to them about truth. It's interesting that this happened at a particular time. It happened right after the event of the young adulterous woman that was brought and carried, drug before him. And she was brought there and they were wanting him to condemn her and to stone her. And Jesus just bent down and in the sand he wrote, he began to write. They pressed him. And so he lifted up and he said, he who is without the first sin, let them cast the first stone. And he bent down and began to write again. Well, in a little while when he was done writing, he looked up and the woman was there alone. And he asked, where are your accusers? And she said, they've all gone. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And so it's in light of this that had just happened. People's curiosity is pricked. They're thinking about this. It just happened. And he says to them, he says, continue in my word and you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. It's interesting to know that truth is really important, isn't it? It is important to know the truth. We could use some examples. They will go through some questions. I want to at, let you answer to tell me if you think it's true or false. Um, smoking is good for you. Not unless you want to die. <laughs> false. It's not good for you, right? Sir General says that it's harmful for your health, causes cancer. And being in healthcare, I see the results of that. Um, a merry heart doeth good like medicine. True or false? That's true, right? Someone who is happy, maybe not obnoxiously happy, which I tend to get to sometimes, but, but someone who is happy, it's nice to see someone who has a smile and greets you. It's good to see you, Michael. Happy Sabbath, right? Marilyn, Jay, good to see you. Beth, Beth and Robert, right? Good to see you. And you too, Eva. It's nice to see people who are friendly, who are happy, right, Steve? It's good to be around those or merry heart. It does good like medicine. That's true. Um, another question. 
Uh, true or false? This is going to be a silly one. If you decided that you wanted to, if you decided you needed a heart surgery, you needed a bypass, you could go research it on the internet, buy your tools, and perform the procedure yourself. <laughs> true or false? Oh. That's pretty obvious, isn't it? That's false. Another question. John Singletary is always happy. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> Yeah, that's a false statement, right? I'm not always happy. My family has seen that. In fact, I have to confess, we were driving up to Seattle one time, and I'm not sure how it happened. Um, I think trying to conserve space, pills were put into smaller containers in an effort, or I'm not sure exactly how it happened. I opened a pill bottle, my wife says it just took when I thought it was my, my reflux medication and it happened to, be, happened to be Carol's thyroid medication. After two days of taking thyroid medication, I was angry. I didn't even know why I was angry, I was just angry. I woke up angry, I was hot, I was perspiring, things were uncomfortable. People whispered to me, I was angry they were whispering, as they talked louder, I was angry they were louder. I just, nothing made me happy, I was angry. Until I found out the truth, I couldn't figure it out. What, my family would say, what is wrong with you? <laughs> to this day, they talk about when dad took mom's medicine. I am glad I don't take that stuff. I was in some kind of thyroid storm. It was terrible. Felt uncomfortable. My mood was up and down and all over the place. And until the truth came to set me free from the effects of that medication, I was trapped inside some emotions I had not felt so strongly before. But the truth did set me free. Carol shared with me that I was grabbing the wrong bottle. So truth is very important. And Jesus is saying that the truth will set you free. Listen to another verse. If you want to turn there, it's in Proverbs 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. True. It's true, right? Every word of God is pure, and it's a shield unto you who put your trust in him. Psalms 119, if you want to flip there real quickly, Psalms 119.9, next book over, says, wherewithal, or in what way, or how, can a young man cleanse his ways? Here's how. By taking heed thereto according to your word. Verse 11 says, Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Your word. And Jesus says, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So when Jesus is talking to the Jews there, he's saying to them, he says, Continue in my word and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. In essence, he's saying, my word is truth. If you follow in my word, it will set you free, right? David declares this. He says in 2 Samuel verse tw or chapter 22 and verse 29, For you are my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all them that trust in him. For who is God, save the Lord? And who is a rock, save God? God is my strength, my power, and he makes my way perfect. David was ascribing his life. He was kind of saying, God, your word, your truth, has made my, my way perfect, my path perfect. The Bible declares more about the word. The word is specifically, Jesus was taking a little further than that, though, because it says, in the beginning was what? The word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And there wasn't anything that was made that was made without him. He created all things. And it says that in him was life, and that life was the light of men. So if you're taking this, Jesus is saying, 
If you, if you follow my words, earlier I said you will be my disciples indeed, but if you follow my words, the truth will set you free. And he's saying here, who's the word? Who's the embodiment of the word? It's Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment of the word. And it says, and this is life eternal, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Because Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one approaches the Father except through me. Jesus is saying to the Jews there, he's saying and to us today, he says, the truth will set you free. I can set you free. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the word of God. I am God come down in the flesh. And in flesh, you know, he became, came down and dwelt with many, tabernacled with men. It was Jesus who represented God to the world. Philip asked him and said, show us the Father. And Philip says, have I been so long with you that you ask, show us the Father? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Right? So he's saying here that I am the truth. I am what can set you free. So the Jews, they, verse 33 in chapter 8 of John, they have an interesting question. They don't really quite understand it. They answered him and said, we be Abraham's children. Abraham's seed. And we're never in bondage to any man. How do you say then, ye shall be made free? It's kind of like Nicodemus coming to Jesus in the garden and said, How can I be born again? He kind of knew the answer, but Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, whoever commits sin is a servant of sin. Or it could be translated as slave of sin. That sin owns you, and you are not free. It's kind of sobering, isn't it? Jesus is telling them basically that they're sinners. And that is the truth when you go through the whole, whole Bible. But there's another point here, too, that we do. And that is that the, they wanted to count the fact that they were Abraham's children. And that gave them a special blessing just for that fact alone. That, that somehow this entitled them to something. That we're not in bondage to anything because we're we're Abraham's children. And Jesus is telling them, you don't understand. Whether Abraham's children by birth or not, if you commit sin, you are a servant to sin. Right? And they were, in a sense, being proud. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Um, I guess this morning I'm sharing some embarrassing moments in my life. So long before the thyroid moment. Um, back in the, when I was in my late teens, 19 years old, um, I thought I was pretty good at racquetball. And I was pretty good at racquetball. In fact, I had probably played, it had been a long time since I had lost a game at racquetball. And being young and being a guy, um, I just thought I was pretty good. So I went over to, the, to a racquetball court next to La Sierra College where I was going to school. And at this particular place, there were some pretty elite racquetball players that would go there. Um, some that were on the professional circuit. And I was hoping to get hooked up with some of them just to kind of see, you know. But I went there and there was this old guy who had just gotten done playing. He was probably 35. <laughs> And, um, but he was really old, and, and he was sweaty. He had a little bit of a stomach like I do now. And I looked at him, and there was no one else around. And I said, you know, would you mind playing a couple games with me? i got to go to class really quick. I'll take it easy on you. <laughs> he just smiled and said, sure. I, hit, I was able to serve twice at the beginning of each game. Didn't score a point, and I didn't even return a single shot. Everything was a kill shot. Everything rolled out from the front. It died in the back. It, nothing. I mean, I, I stumbled on my own feet. I remember falling on the floor several times. I looked, I looked like I didn't know what I was doing. I looked like I played racquetball horribly. And uh, I was a little down, you know, crestfallen, a little disappointed. Realized I wasn't really that good. This old man, 35, had beat me. And he came over and patted me on the shoulder and he said, you know, how good you are is always relative. He said, I, I get to play here the national champion and I'm lucky if I get to score a point or two. Of course, that made me feel any better, right? <laughs> but it, 
But pride comes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And we often do that in many areas of our life. We begin to think that we're really good at things and we can do it. And sometimes we want to say that we can do something for our own salvation. That we can do something. Lord, let me know what I can do to, for my salvation. And the Bible is full. It is chock full of information that says, you are a sinner. All men have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And guess what? Your righteousness is like filthy rags. You may look good next to someone else, but when you go stand next to the Savior, you're like filthy rags. Right? Just like playing racquetball. It may look good next to somebody, but when you get next to, you ne you get next to the model of what the, the best is with Christ, it shows our imperfections. It says in James 4, 6 that God resists the proud, but it gives grace to the humble. But we are all as unclean thing, Isaiah 6 says, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. And in Revelation it says that Jesus... Um, tells the church that we are increased with goods and feel like we have need of nothing, but we are unaware and do not know that we are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Yeah. Those are a lot of really good texts to make me feel good. It's true, though. We all have sin that comes short of the glory of God. There is nothing that we can do. Isaiah says that we have all gone astray like sheep. And on the Lord was laid the iniquity of us all. Paul declares in Romans 7, he says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Right? We're sinners. Amen. We cannot save ourselves. I can no more go and give myself a bypass surgery than I can save myself. It cannot be done. And yet we try. We do try. But in all of our efforts, it's like filthy rags. Have you ever tried to, when you're washing your car, and you, you, I've done this before, I'm washing my car, and in my exuberance, I tend to I wash the wheel, and then I go back to washing the car. And that rag is so dirty after washing that wheel, you're like, why did I do that? You know, get the wheels last. You just can't clean anything if it's dirty, right? And we can't clean ourselves because we are dirty. We are in need of a Savior. Amen. Sin, what Jesus said he would free us from, he said those who are a slave of sin, or those who commit sin are a slave of sin. Sin in 1 John 3, 4 is a transgression of the law. So sin is those who are disobedient. Those who break God's laws and trample on his precepts. And Jesus says, all of us have done that. Right? And then comes that text, Romans 6.23, that Larry read this morning. It says, the wages of sin are what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? So the wages of sin of death. So my life, the, the perfect and just treatment of that, the wages and the earnings from the accumulation of my life is death. That is a very sobering thought. But the good news about Christ and what he's trying to tell them is there found in the last part of this, verse 35 and 36 of John chapter 8. A servant does not abide in the house forever, but the son abides there forever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, he's referring to himself, the Son of God. If the Son will make you free, you will be free what? Indeed. For sure. It behooves you to know this. I have that Dr. Pike in biology that used to tell me, it behooves you. And I would write furiously, because I knew any time Dr. Pike said it behooves you, it was going to be on the test. If he said behooves you twice, it was on the final. I would underline it, you know. Must be really important to him. This really, to me, is like one of those moments because it says, he, it, indeed, it doesn't just say you will be free. It says you will be free indeed. God keeps his promises. He is not slack in keeping his promises. Some, right? He keeps his promises. Romans 8, 1 through 4. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, 
who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in you and I, in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Isn't that good news? Amen. It's God the Son that makes it possible for me to walk according to the law of the Spirit of life and then have life and eternal life. John, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and not stop there, but to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good news? Isaiah 1.18 says, Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be pure as wool. God wants to change us. Right? David the psalmist says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Right? Renew a right spirit within me. Restore unto me the joy of salvation. And then will I teach transgressors your way. Right? God wants to create a clean heart. When you look at the promises of God, and they are numerous, look at what he promises to do for us. This is the truth that he's talking about. It is true that God wants to forgive us. True? Is it true that God can cleanse us from all unrighteousness? In other words, God can cleanse you, yes, you and me from unrighteousness, meaning he can cleanse from us and wash away our tendency to break and trample and be disobedient to the law of God. It is true that he will write his law on our hearts and our minds, right? It is true that he gives to all men a measure of faith. It is true that he calls us brothers and that we are now joint heirs with Christ, adopted into the family of God. That we're not just, we're not just a, another creator. We are, we are the children of God, the king of the universe, the creator, right? It is God that says, let not your hearts be troubled, right? Don't be troubled because I am going to prepare. It's true, right? He's going to prepare a place for you. And he's coming back to receive us unto himself. It is God that says, as far as the heavens are above the earth, are my thoughts and your thoughts. I are my ways than your ways. And I will remove your sins from you as far as the east is from the west. That's pretty far, isn't it? That's an infinite God. He says, I will remember your sins no more. That is, that is truth. That is who our God is. Many people try to, be, try to wrestle with this and they struggle. And they say, well, I keep doing sin or I keep doing things wrong. And I wrestle. And the devil points things out to them. And they go, there's no good in me. I don't know. And they struggle with it. Some are on the other spectrum. And they're like the Pharisees and go, oh, thank goodness I'm not like that person over there. And we wrestle with this because we're focused on ourselves. But God wants us to focus on Christ, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Right? And Jesus also focused on his father. He said he didn't even speak anything unless he was guided by his father. But when he was living as a sacrifice for us, willing to die for us, and then indeed did die for us, it says that he did that because he was looking forward to the joy that was set before him. And we are that joy. Right? And he sits down on the right hand of the throne of God. Now, in Jewish custom, the attorney or lawyer that sat down on the right hand of the throne of the judge was the one who was your advocate and your defender. The accuser would be on the left hand. So writing that to the Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 12, they would understand what Paul was saying, that Jesus is our defender, right? That he is set down on the right hand of the throne of God to defend us, right? It is true 
that we have an advocate with the Father who in all points was tempted but did not sin. Right? And it is true that we have a perfect Lamb of God that died and rose again and is coming back. That's truth. And it is also true that he who has begun a good work in you is faithful and able to complete it and to finish it. Amen. Right? Amen. See, I think what we struggle with is the deceptiveness of this world and the deceptions that there are in this world. We, we lose hope because we don't, we don't realize the full impact of the truth of what God is trying to tell us. That the equation is not just us. When you put infinite with any number, what is your, what does that equal? Infinite. When God is infused in you, he says, abide in me and I in you. If you abide in me, you can do what? You can do all things. Without me, you can do nothing. But with me, you can do all things. See, when we connect ourselves, when we accept God's gift, he's knocking the door and we open it and we submit ourselves to Christ, he can do all things through us, right? We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It is God that can supply all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus our Lord, right? Philippians chapter 4. The truth is we are to look to Jesus and that he can change you. That's the truth. It's, it's, it's tried to cover it up. People try to hide it. They try to say it's hard. They try to say this is difficult. Jesus says something opposite. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The difficult part is surrender. To actually go and put on that yoke, carry that burden, which is easy and light. We struggle. We're like Jacob wrestling on the side. We, we wrestle with self, right? I want to do things myself. I want to be able to say I did something. Wasn't it, wasn't it Nebuchadnezzar who said, this is that great Babylon I have built? And then he spent seven years eating grass with the dew on his forehead till he realized that there was only one God that sets up kings and takes them down and knows the end from the beginning. That is the truth. And I was talking to my daughter on the way in today and I said, you know, I have the message today is a bit simple. And then it struck me that God uses the simple things to confound the wise, right? We try to make this more complex than it is. We try to add layer upon layer of difficulty when in reality we must run to Christ like the little children and seek his blessing. And it says that all who come unto me I will no eyes cast out. If you go to Jesus, truth, he will not turn you away. If you cast all your care upon him, he cares for you. He listens and he hears. Before you have asked, he says, he has what? He has answered. He knows us. And he knows the number of hair on our head, which is getting less now. Right, Mike? Amen. Amen. <laughs> and I won't go yet. Some of us is real easy to count. Uh, easier. Um, but God knows everything keeps the entire universe going and yet he cares about each one of us and that is truth. So the truth is a simple truth and that there is no way to approach the Father except through Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And that is the truth that will set you free. Right? Free from sin, free from disobedience, free from transgression, free from the things that, free from the wages of sin, and you receive the gift of God, which is eternal life, right? Free from yourself. Free from ourself, yeah. right? And what I like to think about is, what is it going to be like when Christ comes? Can we imagine what it's going to be like when, when, when life is restored? Do we have, I guess we can't imagine, because I imagine a whole bunch of things. I've imagined with my kids a planet that is one giant water slide, and you go through and you eat fruit like mangoes as you're going through. And, you know, you spend a year on this water slide because what's a year in the light of eternity, you know? 
And, uh, you know, every seven days on this slide, we stop and we have worship and we pray and sing and have a great time. And then we hop back on. You know, that's, that's kind of the thing, you know. But it says that I has not seen nor ear heard, nor is entered into the hearts of men or into their imagination what God has prepared for those who love him. Amen. Right? It is unimaginably good. You, you can imagine some really great things and it's still not going to be as good or as big or as awesome as what God has prepared for you who love him. Some of my favorite texts are when Jesus comes. It says that the, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel and the trumpet of God, and then the dead in Christ will rise first. <laughs> That's going to be a scene, isn't it? Isn't that going to be an awesome scene? Think about it. Grandpa, grandma, poof, there you are. They're no longer old. You know, they're not old like that 35-year-old racquetball player anymore. They're young. They're ready to move in the vibrant of life. And then we which are alive and remain, we get caught up in the air with him and so into the clouds to meet the Lord. And so shall we ever be with him. You know, and then it says this corruption will take on incorruption and this mortality will take on immortality. Death, where is your sting? Oh, grave, where is your victory? There is some wonderful things that God wants us to know. He wants us to know the truth because the truth will set you free. And this is the truth that my God and Savior, Jesus Christ, died for you and for me. And that his blood is there for the remission of my sins and saves me. And that he will change out my heart. And this old creature, this thorny, prickly, angry, thyroid-inducing creature will take on a, become a new creature, completely and wholly new, not partially, but wholly new in Christ, because he said he can do it. Amen. That's the truth. And that's the hope we have as Christians. When you know and you understand that when you are with God, it says in 1 John that if I abide in you and you in me, you cannot sin. That's an interesting study if you want to do it. I don't want to go down that road in some ways because it also says in 1 John, if you go around telling everybody that you haven't sinned, then, well, it kind of defeats the purpose and you have sinned. We're all sinners. But our Savior is Christ, and when he abides in us, sin cannot abide where Christ is. So when Christ is there with us, that's the truth. That he will give us faith. He'll give us forgiveness. He'll give us repentance. He'll give us a new heart. And he gives us everlasting life. That's the truth. Amen. And knowing the truth will set you free. Amen. Um, let's bow our heads in prayer. We're going to let out early today for you. So um, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sabbath and for this chance to be together. Lord, your message of remission of sins and repentance, and the fact that you died and paid our penalty on the cross, that we know that through one man sin came into the world and that through another we have redemption and salvation through your Son, your only begotten Son. Lord, I ask that you plant seeds of truth in our heart that you will give us the courage and strength to resist the devil so that he will flee from us. And may there be a thousand that fall on our left and ten thousand on our right side, but may no harm come us. Lord, we thank you for the promise of a room made for us with our name and that there is a crown awaiting for us and that you can change us and make us into your image again. Thank you for that promise. We are grateful. We sing your praises. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. amen.